Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I guess I'm the uh, next to the last one. So I'm trying to entertain uh, people here <laughs> in late afternoon uh, Friday. Uh, you know, as you can see, I'm uh, you know, posing you know, very you know, broad, but at the same time, uh, fundamental question, which is can East Asia compete uh, with North America and uh, Western Europe? Uh, someone may wonder that I may have reversed the question. Uh, I should have said, uh, can uh, North America compete with East Asia, right? So I think to give a little background, uh, I'm, where I'm coming from, uh, I live in the Silicon Valley. So maybe I'm too much influenced by talks uh, in the Silicon Valley, but uh, obviously uh, it's really hot uh, in Silicon Valley these days and maybe even bubble, and pretty much everybody coming to Silicon Valley these days about how we can emulate uh, Silicon Valley. So uh, even uh, Mr. Abe came to uh, Silicon Valley and Stanford uh, late April, and I was quite surprised to learn that it's the first visit ever by Japanese Prime Minister to Silicon Valley. So which means that now finally maybe Japan is recognizing uh, the value of Silicon Valley. So that's one point. And I was trained as a sociologist, uh, even though I'm not sure if I am anymore. Uh, so I'll try to focus on more cultural and social issues uh, in my presentation. OK. Uh, so I don't think I have much time to go over, but I guess uh, if I can summarize uh, East Asia model, I mean, this may be in our main features, like cheap labor and uh, exports, uh, oriented industrialization and big business in case of Japan and, and South Korea, and developmental states that we talked about already today, and uh, nationalism, the value of solidarity, and you know, emphasis on human resource and uh, brain circulation. You know, when I say brain cir circulation, like in you know, many countries like Korea, now China, uh, they send out they bright talent uh, to study abroad, and they bring back, and then they make a uh, you know, big contribution to uh, their development. Uh, that's what I call by you know, you know, brain circulation. But maybe in this new era, uh, something may be different. So here, you know, innovation uh, is very important. Uh, I mean, you know, we often uh, compare, you know, Apple with uh, Samsung, now maybe with the Xiaomi, and, you know, Samsung is doing pretty well, but uh, I don't think, you know, they can ever, maybe I shouldn't say ever, but uh, they don't really, you know, innovate. Uh, they'll be fast follower, but uh, you know, Apple is the one uh, who, who, you know, you know, you know, you know made uh, the, uh, the smartphone, you know, in the beginning. So innovation is important. Uh, entrepreneurship uh, is becoming more and more important. And maybe global talent, especially okay, foreign uh, skilled labor, uh, is very, very important. Uh, I mean, I don't have time to go over, but uh, I, I always say that you know, Silicon Valley is not made by white Caucasian Americans. You know, without immigrants, like Chinese and you know, Indian engineers, there's no way to build uh, in a Silicon Valley that they have today. And this is something that you know, I think Asian countries uh, need to recognize. And cultural diversity uh, is very, very important. Uh, I'm sure for a long time, uh, Korea and Japan, they were very proud of being homogeneous. And it, it may be useful you know, you know, for industrial development, but now it might become a liability. They really have to promote. Uh, more diversity, and transnational bridging also uh, becoming uh, more and more important. So, you know, once again, I don't think I have time to go over all those things. So I just highlight, you know, a few of them, especially uh, global talent and and cultural diversity. You know, why they are becoming so important. And you know, my main argument is that in order for East Asia to compete with North America and Europe, uh, and like uh, Silicon Valley, they really have to uh, attract uh, global talent. In order to do so, they have to promote uh, <clears throat> cultural diversity. So that's sort of main, main, my main argument 
uh, in my presentation, and I like to be more provocative given that I'm speaking in, in Korea right now. So, uh, as you know, the current uh, Korean government is trying to promote what they call uh, create uh, economy, and I don't think many people know what that means. <laughs> right? Uh, in the Silicon Valley, we are joking that uh, the more the stay involved, then you know, the, less is yes, the less creative uh, the economy becomes. But anyway, so, you know, we are saying uh, this is the era of uh, globalization. And of course, there's a more movement uh, among, you know, goods and among, you know, capital. But I think, you know, one thing is really becoming important is more movement of people uh, around the world. And now, I think many countries now fighting uh, for uh, what they call global talent, you know, really skilled uh, technicians or professionals uh, around the world. Uh, in the past, uh, we have focused on unskilled labor. I mean, even in Korea, uh, they have uh, imported uh, many unskilled labor from China and uh, Southeast Asia. But now, I think uh, attracting uh, skilled labor will be uh, more and more important. And especially uh, countries like Korea and Japan, and I think even China, <laughs> with a low birth rate, right, and aging population, uh, you know, attracting uh, skilled labor uh, from, you know, in a foreign country will become uh, very important. <laughs> At the same time, uh, it's much more challenging uh, for East Asia because uh, compared to uh, immigrant countries like uh, US, Canada, Australia, you know, Koreans and Japanese, they're not really friendly to foreigners, uh, to be honest, right? I mean, right, Professor Lin, right? <laughs> so, so this is kind of, uh, you know, quite striking uh, table that I sort of uh, gathered for information like, collected by uh, INSEAD, which is a French school, uh, business school. So uh, they uh, published what they call Global Talent uh, Comparativeness Index. So if you look at uh, those countries, okay, so US, Canada, Australia, okay, I mean, they are basically uh, immigrant countries. Uh, their uh, ranking is fairly high. I mean, U.S. number four, Canada number five, and uh, Australia number nine. I mean, that's a global talent comparativeness uh, rank. Okay, Japan, uh, Korea, and China, you know, very low. I mean, that must be very disappointing because now, you know, Chinese saying now they are maybe number one or two in their economy in the world. I mean, Japan is still maybe number three or four. I mean, even South Korea is top 15 country uh, in the world. But in terms of their uh, global talent uh, competitiveness you know, index, they are really bad, right? I mean, like, uh, you know, 20th for Japan, 29th for South Korea, China for 41st. And among other factors, uh, I would point out, you know, brain drain here. So, you know, U.S. doesn't lose much brain power, but like Japan, Korea, China, they are losing, uh, you know, brain power. At the same time, here, brain gain, they are quite bad uh, in gaining brain from uh, other countries. If you look at Japan, you know, 48th. But if you look at U.S. number five, Canada number seven, I think interesting case is Australia because uh, they're uh, 25 uh, in the rank of brain drain, so they're losing power, but at the same time, they are gaining at the same time. So among other factors, what you know, make that difference? Uh, I'd say that, look at this one, tolerance to immigrants and tolerance to minorities. You know, Canada number one, they're quite high. But look at this. Now, simply saying, uh, East Asians are not tolerant to immigrants and or ethnic minorities. So I think that sh you know, has a lot of implication 
for the future development uh, of East Asian countries. So to give you a little more uh, concrete uh, idea, okay, you know, this uh, shows uh, state rates uh, for PhDs uh, among foreign students okay, coming to study uh, in the United States in the fields of science and engineering. So that doesn't include humanities or uh, social science, but uh, in terms of PhDs in science and engineering. If you look at China, you know, in, in 2001, almost every Chinese state uh, in the United States. Even 10 years later, 2011, 85%. Those from India, about 82%. Okay, they are the one who really built uh, Silicon Valley in my view, because uh, if you go to Silicon Valley, there's a lot of Indian and Chinese engineers, right? Because uh, I think like uh, if you go to uh, engineering schools like uh, Berkeley or Stanford, you know, it's pretty much all Asian, <laughs> right? You know, you know, white Caucasians, they don't really go to study engineering anymore, right? So, so without, you know, those foreign talent, uh, U.S. economy cannot really function. I mean, once again, you know, a key example is Silicon Valley. So if you go to you know, Cupertino, where the Apple has its quarter, you know, it's all Chinese and all Indian, right? But let's compare that to Korea. So now, you know, you know Korea also you know, having a lot of uh, international you know, students. Of course, uh, very small compared to the uh, United States, but about almost 100,000 you know, foreign students. So this is based on survey. So if you look at here, maybe you know, about 20%, uh, they like to, uh, let's see, uh, continue uh, education in their home country, and another about 20%. Uh, they like to get job uh, in their home country. At the same time, you know, a good number of you know, people uh, wanted to uh, and have a job uh, in Korea after education, about almost 20%. But here, if you look at by uh, number of uh, their, I mean, the year of their grade, so initially many wanted to stay in Korea, like uh, here. So about you know 13% saying when they're freshmen they like to continue their education in Korea, but by senior year, none. They all wanted to leave Korea after four years of education. In freshmen, about 30% wanted to say wanted to you know, get a job uh, in Korea, but by senior year, less than 10%. And we've been looking very really hard about uh, you know, how many foreign students uh, get job in Korea after education. There isn't really any uh, official statistics. You know, we contact some uh, international office at universities, and they say we don't collect uh, such data. So the best estimate uh, is like uh, only like one percent. Maybe it's kind of low. So I, let's say you know one to five percent of international students. Uh, after education in Korea, they stay to work. So, if you compare those two tables, you know, for United States, most of, most of them want to stay after a PhD. In Korea, most of them either leaving or wanting to leave. So, I mean, you can easily, you know, speculate what the future will be like uh, for those two countries as they compete, uh, you know, in the world. So. Here I'm saying that uh, you know, you know, countries like Korea, Japan, they, they need you know fresh thinking and uh, new strategy. So I have done some work already as uh, certain parts of this project, but I'm also collecting data in other parts. So my argument is that uh, we should appreciate the value of cultural diversity and establish a new immigration policy. And some may say, well, sure, you know, we are promoting already uh, multiculturalism. And I'm going to come back to the question why it's already failed policy after maybe 10 years. 
And also we should think about how to convert okay, brain drain or brain loss into uh, brain linkage. Because I know that you know, until now, the main policy is to bring back uh, their people who went to study abroad. But no matter how hard they work, still a lot of them will stay. Uh, you know, if I give example uh, from Stanford, I know, you know many from China, Korea, they want to stay in the Silicon Valley after education. Now Samsung, you know, LG, you know, they are coming to recruit uh, Korean students, but still their preference is to stay in the Silicon Valley, right? So, I mean, that's a reality. So maybe, you know, if we can bring back to their own country, that's great. But no matter what, still some of them will remain. Then what are you going to do? I mean, you know, maybe I'm one example because uh, I left Korea in 1983 with every intention of coming back, but I never returned. <laughs> right? I'm still staying. I'm still teaching uh, in American University. But still, I think you know, I can make a contribution to Korea even if I stay in the United States. So how? I think that should be I think, new thinking uh, for Korea, Japan, and other uh, Asian countries. So let me just give you a little bit of uh, finding because uh, time is limited. So here, uh, regarding uh, global talent, uh, I would say that uh, we should maybe you know, shift okay, our thinking uh, from focus on human capital into stress on social capital. So until now, the you know, main policy was to bring back. In Korea, you know, Korea you know, during the 1970s, uh, the Korean government you know, provided a lot of incentive to Korean scientists or engineers uh, staying in the United States. So they came back and they made a lot of contribution. So still, you know, still that's important. I'm not saying that uh, we should stop doing that. That's still important. But once again, at the same time, what are you going to do for those who stay? Once again, no matter what you know, you're trying to do, still some people will stay uh, abroad. So here, uh, I'm saying that we should uh, look at the value of social capital and trying to uh, promote what I call uh, brain linkage. So, I mean, I don't have to you know, go through about the value of social capital, but basically promoting trust and you know, networks and so on. And then I think there are different kinds of uh, or types of social capital. Uh, here, kind of bonding social capital. So, you know, you have a network, you know, within your own area, like Seoul, and then you can build your network in other areas, like you know, you know, Busan or Gwangju, and then you can bridge. Uh, between the two, the two cities. But if you, you know, go further, then you can bridge uh, between countries, like you know, US and you know, Korea. So, uh, you know, my own case, I'm trying to really you know, bridge between uh, Korean and American academic and you know, policy communities. So, uh, even if I don't return uh, to Korea, even if I stay in Korea, I think I can make some contribution to both U.S. and Korea by uh, trying to you know, bridge uh, between the two countries. So I think that's something that we should promote uh, in the coming uh, years and decades. So let me skip and then, so diversity. So you know, once again, now you know, many you know, foreign workers and foreign students are in Korea. But their experience not that uh, you know all positive. Uh, we interview about you know 50 uh, foreign students uh, studying in Korean university, basically top universities like Seoul National, Yonsei, KAIST, uh, and so on. You know, you know, I can give you more examples, but I think by and large uh, they are quite uh, stressed out uh, because uh, you know Koreans don't really you know, interact with international you know students. So two days ago, I gave a talk uh, at Hengjong Deagwon and uh, to a group of you know, international students who came to study at SNU. Uh, they are more like uh, professionals. And then some of them saying that you know, they uh, even live together in a dormitory in the same room. 
but then they hardly talk to each other. They say, you know, good morning and then good night. That's it, <laughs> right? So, you know, I think, you know, in a sense, you know, Koreans are losing a lot of opportunities to build their networks with international students. So, I'll just have to skip this one. So, you know, when you ask questions to, you know, Koreans about, you know, cultural diversity, I think they are quite ambivalent. Okay, they believe that uh, ethnic, uh, religious, and cultural diversity will help to enhance Korea's national competitiveness, about, you know, half. But at the same time, they think that uh, Koreans, uh, you know, foreigners in Korea should follow Korean traditions and customs okay, rather than their own, so highly assimilationist. So, you know, someone may say, you know, Korea has been promoting uh, multiculturalism. I mean, they, they've been doing it for almost the you know, last 10 years. But they are quite selective. Uh, they are focused on, uh, you know, foreign brides and also, you know, K-12. to And their policy has been highly assimilationist. Right? So that, you know, when you say, you know, you are from, you know, multicultural family, it has very negative connotation. It's not, nothing really positive. So, I'm trying to find, you know, really good, you know, rhetoric or discourse and uh, language to replace uh, multiculturalism. So right now I'm just using, you know, cultural diversity, but eventually we'll have to find, I think, better rhetoric, better framework. So that it's not simply uh, you know, helping uh, vulnerable groups like a foreign bride, but we really have to uh, make Koreans understand you know, why diversity is important. It's not simply helping uh, foreigners, but promoting diversity can be really useful for Korea and Korean people. So once again, you know, diversity can promote uh, innovation and development, and once again, a most clear example is in Silicon Valley. If you go to Silicon Valley, it's such a diverse community. And the only way you can promote diversity, I believe that uh, innovation can come out. You know, when you have uh, you know, people from the you know, same background, same education, I don't think you can really uh, create something different or creative. Okay, so in conclusion, so right now, you know, you know, you know, advanced countries will be competing uh, for global talent, and then unless you can provide uh, culture and society that are friendly to foreigners, uh, you can really attract uh, global talent. Unless you can attract global talent, uh, you're gonna lose. So that's sort of my uh, conclusion, and hopefully we can have more discussion uh, later. Thank you.